Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, I'd like to welcome you to our web event entitled Patient and Family-Centered Care for Adults with Chronic Conditions. I'm Judy Consalvo with ARC's Center for Outcomes and Evidence. We're very excited about today's topic and glad to see that you share our enthusiasm. We have over 700 who registered for this event today. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I would like to introduce you to our webcast console. The console can be resized to fit your entire browser window. All the components on the console can be resized, moved, and minimized into the menu dock at the bottom of the console. If the slides are too small, click on the lower right-hand corner of the slide window and drag your mouse down to make it larger. Twitter functionality is available in the console for today's webcast. Please feel free to participate using the hashtag AHRQIX. We're pleased to offer closed captioning on this web seminar. To access it, click on the link called Closed Captioning that is on the lower right-hand side of your screen view. After you click the link, a new window will display the captioning. I would also like to remind you that if you experience any technical problems, you may click on the question mark button at the bottom of the screen to access the help guide or click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to contact us with your question. Our technical staff will work with you to resolve any issues. The last 15 minutes of this web seminar is reserved for a discussion based on questions that you submit. Questions may be submitted at any time during the presentation. Just simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question into the Q&A box and select Submit. We welcome your questions and comments on the upcoming presentation and look forward to an engaging dialogue that will promote the spread of healthcare innovations. Next slide, please. So today's slides are available by clicking on the widget at the bottom of your screen that says Download Slides. This will generate a PDF version of the presentation that you can download and save. Next slide, please. So the presenter that you will hear from today is an innovator from ARC's Healthcare Innovations Exchange. For those of you who are new to the Innovations Exchange, I'll take just a minute to give you an overview. ARC created the Innovations Exchange to speed the implementation of new and better ways of delivering healthcare. It offers busy health professionals and researchers a variety of opportunities to share, learn about, and ultimately adopt evidence-based innovations and tools suitable for a range of healthcare settings and populations. The website includes a searchable database of quality tools, service delivery, and policy innovations. The exchange also contains both successes and attempts innovators' stories and lessons learned, and expert commentaries. To assist you in implementing these innovations, ARC also supports learning and networking opportunities such as web seminars, tweet chats, and podcasts. We also post new content to the website every two weeks on a range of topics and hope that you will sign up to stay connected with us if you have not already done that. Next slide, please. So this is the Innovations Exchange web event series. We have a number of upcoming web events to share innovative healthcare strategies and promote the spread of innovations. Our next learning and networking event will take place on July 22nd from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time called Patient and Family-Centered Care for Children and Older Adults. To register for this web event or receive more information, please visit our website at www.innovations.arc.gov. Our website also holds an archive of our past web events, podcasts, and tweet chats, and we invite you to take a look and download those materials that may be useful to you in your practice. Next slide, please. So we will get started with today's event moderator. 
It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ms. Beverly H. Johnson, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care. Ms. Johnson has provided technical assistance and consultation for advancing the practice of patient and family-centered care to over 250 hospitals, health systems, federal, state, and provincial agencies, military treatment facilities, and community organizations. She assists hospitals and ambulatory programs with changing organizational culture and facilitates visioning retreats and the integration of patient and family-centered care concepts in policies, programs, and practices, as well as in facility design and the education of healthcare professionals. Beth? Thank you, Judy. It is wonderful to join you and ARC and all the terrific folks on the call today to talk about patient and family-centered care and really building a system uh, of care for older um, adults with chronic conditions. Um, I think it's important that we ground our understanding with a really shared vision of what does patient and family-centered mean. At the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, we define um, this approach to care as um, an approach to the planning, implementation, and evaluation of healthcare that's grounded in mutually beneficial partnerships among patients, families, and healthcare professionals. I think it's really important for all of you on the call today to, to really remember that phrase of mutually beneficial partnerships. The core concepts, there are only four, and it was really the researchers that helped us um, build the definition that originally started with nine concepts to really four, and they're respect and dignity, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. And that respect and dignity means it's for every patient and family that we convey respect and assure their dignity. But it also means it's for all staff and clinicians in all organizations, whether it's in a hospital, a clinic, a long-term care community. Second, this approach to care, patient and family-centered care, changes the way we share information. We share complete and unbiased information and particularly in ways that are affirming and useful. That's what we've learned from patients and families as to how they want information shared with them. The third is, and we know we get the best clinical outcomes, when we encourage and support the active participation of patients and families in care and decision making and connect with them at the level they choose. At first, they may not feel that they have the confidence or the competence to be active participants in care. But if we connect with them and work in a respectful way and share useful information, they can become more engaged in their care. And lastly, and what we will be talking about a lot today with our real expert innovator on the phone, Bernard Robertson, is this collaboration, not just in the clinical encounter, but the collaboration in redesigning our healthcare system. We need patients and families as partners to help us make the right decisions to build a high quality, safe healthcare um, system that is cost efficient as well. So Collaboration means collaborating in policy and program development, in professional education, in research, um, in really all ways that impact the patient and family experience. The, um, a short definition of patient and family-centered care is working with patients and families, not just doing to and for them. So remember that word with. It's extremely important. And we also, in thinking about it, I'm sure each of you in your communities are serving a, an increasingly diverse community. We all define our families in our own unique ways. And I think the American Academy of Family Physicians has developed a very uh, thoughtful, uh, useful definition, um, which basically defines family as a group of individuals with a continuing legal, genetic, and or emotional relationship um, with the patient. And in thinking about it in practice, you want to make sure that your documentation systems 
support you to ask each patient who is their family and how you want them involved in care. That's a critical decision. It helps get HIPAA out of the way so you can share that useful information with whomever the patient prefers. I think in in healthcare over the last 20 years, we've We've somewhat used the terms patient-centered care and patient and family-centered care um, interchangeably. And I think we have to rethink that. that. That little word family is extremely important, particularly if broadly defined and particularly if we're talking about uh, people with chronic conditions. They're the very people that need people to help them manage the transitions of care, manage the complexity of care, and just, to, you know, giving them the hope and the inspiration to continue to take the medications or the therapies. Social isolation is a risk factor. And so as clinicians and staff, we need to, to uh, think about and build that uh, word family into how we describe our healthcare system. You know, how are, other, how are families involved in other ways? I really view families as allies for quality and safety. My mom's 100 years old, and I'm part of her healthcare team, involved as she wants me, but I help uh, assure she has quality care and that she's safe. Um, often families are the constant across settings, and I know many of you are working on transitions of care. To think that the patient can manage that all by themselves without some form of natural support um, is real, we're fooling ourselves, and that we need um, to enlist families early in healthcare experiences so they can be helpful across the transitions. And certainly they can help in the development of care plans and help support the patient in continuing to follow the, the plan. Um, as we think about, you know, building at the, at the policy level, and I think so many of you are, are working on trying to achieve the triple aim, Don Berwick said uh, two years ago at our international conference that the most direct route to the triple aim is via implementation of patient and family-centered care in its fullest form. And that means true partnerships with patients and families to improve the experience of care, to improve the health of populations, and to reduce costs. That we really need that partnership with patients and families. A resource that you may find useful after today's webinar, if you've not read the Institute of Medicine's uh, 2012 publication, Best Care at Lower Cost, The Path to Continuously Learning in, in um, America. I highly recommend it, and it talks throughout um, the publication about a learning healthcare system and where we need to factor in the perspectives of patients and families. And you're going to learn more about that later in this webinar, about how you can really integrate the insights and perspectives of patients and families in healthcare processes, in the creation and use of technologies, and very importantly, in the training of clinicians as we build that next generation of um, workforce. We need to partner with patients and families. The IOM had an, another interesting article that was published uh, about, um, I think, a year ago. And it talked about so many of you I know are working on team-based care. And in the IOM original report on this, they had all the different players on the team, but the one group that they left off were patients and families. And so I think you might find this short article of um, helpful to you in your work. In high-functioning healthcare teams, patients are members of the team, not simply objects of the team's attention. So it, we really want to make them part of that collaborative team. As we have an opportunity in the United States to really build a robust primary care system. And as we think about redesigning primary care, I think the best practice um, 
everyone feels in caring for adults with chronic conditions is self-management support. And I view that approach to care as basically a pa- patient and family-centered approach for caring for people with chronic conditions. And in this slide, you can see the computer um, is really part of the conversation with that clinician and that patient. That the physician has it supporting um, so that real data can be shared with the patient so they can see notes and lab work and together discuss it, that he's not standing over the patient. This looks more like a partnership picture. And the tool, the clinical tools here were actually designed um, by patient and family advisors working with staff to develop tools that felt better to patients with diabetes. These are uh, clinical diabetes tools, and, and they benefit by the partnership with staff as well. A new innovation just in the last year or so is very exciting to see is open notes. And again, it's opening up the communication of physicians with other physicians um, and including the patient and family. Um, and that family is involved only if the patient wishes it. It's according to the patient's preference. But it puts the patient really on the team when the uh, office notes or hospital notes are shared openly with the patient, it's really a safety strategy in many ways. So I hope you'll go to this website and learn more about Open Notes. I like what it's doing in terms of helping clinicians write in more respectful, uh, collaborative ways with patients. It really does change the culture there. Um, for best practices in, in hospital care, the Anne Arundel Medical Center started on the patient and family center journey just in 2010, and they already have 80 patient and family advisors. And they have made an enormous step in changing the culture of their organization in that they don't have, quote, uh, open visitation, but they welcome families 24 hours a day, seven days a week, according to patient preference. So they are welcoming families as part of the team. They have worked hard at changing care processes like bedside nurse changer shifts, so it's done with the patient and family, not just geographically getting in the room, but really doing it with the, the uh, patients and families as partners, essential partners in their care. And they also have developed a tool, the Smart Discharge Tool, to help families participate in that transition planning process. Another best practice um, is shown here from the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. They realized that they needed to do a much better job about advanced care planning and really involving patients and families in deciding how they wanted to be cared for in various situations. And all these little boxes, I know you can't read them, but this organizational change structure shows that patients and family advisors are part of every part of this process of change. In every one of these boxes, they partner with patient and family advisors to help bring about this change in practice. Um, I'd, I'd like to just highlight a moment because Bernard is going to, to cover in much more depth about working with patient and family advisors because I think that's what is most essential and the most important takeaway. You can't build a patient and family-centered system of care without um, advisors. And so the best practices for leaders are that they believe in the possibility and the potential of patient and family partnerships, that there's an executive champion to to show the commitment to patient and family-centered practice, that there's a designated staff liaison for collaborative endeavors, and you're going to see that in uh, the leadership role that Bernard has, and certainly that there's orientation and preparation for collaboration for patient and family advisors, but for staff and clinicians and leaders, and that you involve patients and families from the beginning in this work. So there are a number of resources on the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care website. There are many free downloads. You can just Google IPFCC and we'll pop up, and I hope these will be useful to you. 
And now it's such an honor to introduce Bernard Roberson to you. We've been colleagues for a number of years, and uh, I first met Bernard when he had joined the then called MCG Health in Augusta, Georgia, and he was part of the implementation of the pilot unit for patient and family-centered care in the Neurosciences Center of Excellence. And he, so he really brings a depth of, of knowledge and experience of how to get this started, how to move it forward, and have the pilot become the model for the health system. He currently serves as the Administrative Director for Patient and Family-Centered Care, and the organization is called Ju Georgia Regents Medical Center, still located in Augusta, Georgia. So it's just a pleasure to introduce Bernard to you. Thank you, Bev, for that introduction. I'd like to talk with you today about patients and families as advisors. And, you know, it really begins with recruitment. Um, recruitment of, of your patient and family advisors is critical to the success of your program. And where you want to start is with your faculty and your staff and your administrators and getting them to recommend patients and families that they've worked with patients and families that bring things to the table uh, with them. Uh, they don't just come to the table to complain. They come to the, the table with changes, with ideas of making change. And, and so you want to make sure you start with the people who really work with your organization um, on a daily basis, um, your, your faculty, your staff, your administrators, um, and have them to bring people in that they can work with uh, to help move your program forward. Um, you must utilize, you know, patients and families that are, are satisfied or dissatisfied. You know, you don't want to get everybody that's, that's just uh, happy with your services. You want some of those people who, who were not so happy and, and who have some great ideas for how to fix some of the issues that they found in your organization. And you really do want them to come when they come to be... Uh, uh, highly recommended. So some of the qualities uh, your, your patient and family advisor should possess is they must have a positive attitude. You want someone that's going to come there and, and really be positive about what they're doing 
you know, willing to, to assist with, with the change, um, to assist with educating uh, faculty and staff on what it means to be a patient in that healthcare system and, and how they can better work with, um, with, with, with the faculty and staff. You know, you want them to have the ability to share their, experience, their experiences and insights, the ability to listen and reflect on differing points, to be able to work with, with, with everyone. You want somebody that can come in. Um, I always tell my advisors, I want somebody that can talk to a tree and don't worry about it talking back. And so you, you want them to be willing to look beyond their own personal issues and willing to work with others as active members of the, of the team. You want folks that, that look like the people you serve. You know, you want them to look like the folks that sit in your waiting room. And you want to bring patient and families in as advisors, you know, during brainstorming sessions and when you're planning new services or developing new policies and procedures or implementing new policies and procedures. You know, we like to, to say, you know, who better to help us develop our policies than the people we're developing for? And so we had to look at the, the, the opportunity to not just look at the folks who want to, we're developing for, we want to develop with. So we found that working with our patient and family advisors to create new policies and procedures actually helps not only the faculty and staff, but it helps the families to understand the processes that the organizations have to go through. You want to bring them in and in, uh, interviewing new leadership, um, educating staff, you know, changing clinical uh, processes. And then, you know, partnering is, is a factor in all aspects. You know, you got to look at it from strategic planning, uh, management, and operations. Um, we tend to involve patients and families, you know, with, with our patient satisfaction surveys, looking at the results. You know, how do we, how do we improve those, those surveys? You know, the electronic personal health record. You know, with meaningful use, it was really important for us to have a really good um, patient portal, and having patients and families look at the, 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 the process and work with the IT team to develop the right um, patient portal um, for, for delivering information was very important to us. Um, family faculty, you know, this is, uh, these, these are patients and families who go into our classrooms. We're an academic medical center, and they go into our classroom. They teach alongside our regular faculty, and they talk about the things that are important to patients and families, you know, what, what kind of health care provider patients and families are looking for and what's important to them. Sorry about that. I get caught up in, in what I'm doing and sometimes I forget to advance my slides. So, uh, uh, family faculty also is, is, is looking at those personal stories, you know, looking at how we are to make it better. How do we move forward with, with, with creating new uh, and advanced educational programs? Looking at what it is uh, that, that new pro health care providers can, can bring to the table um, after graduating and how they treat their patients. So patients and families are also involved with, with quality and safety committees, uh, with the ethics committee, uh, joint commission. Um, when we had our last joint commission survey, we had uh, patients and families as a part of, of the survey process. And I tell you, it is one of those things where, you know, the surveyors are sometimes even uh, amazed that having patients and families there can sometimes be intimidating. You know, they, the, the, the patients and families are sitting there, they're hearing what the organization's issues are at the same time as the leadership, and sometimes it's, it's more intimidating to the, the surveyors than it is to the leadership because we know as, as health care providers, we know that we have our patients and families engaged in what we're doing as a part of, uh, of what we're doing. They are our partners, and they help us to get through these things. They help us with our safety and security and our medication error prevention 
discharge education and planning. And even we have them on our what we call quality unit councils where patients and families um, are, are ad, as advisors are sitting there with the chairs and the vice chairs um, of, of the different departments with the nurse managers and other dis disciplines, you know, talking about how do we improve quality for, for individual units? How do we improve the safety? How do we improve, you know, uh, our patient satisfaction and making sure that families are comfortable and welcomed in our unit? How do we, we make patient and family-centered care a top priority, you know, for our unit? So patients and families are, are involved in our community coalitions and outreach initiatives. We, we involve them when we're doing um, health fairs out in the community, and they, they talk about what the organization does. Um, to, to make it better for patients and families and how they're involved, you know, and why are they involved. You know, they look at new renovations and construction projects. They're a part of that. They have to sign off on, on the blueprints to, that saying that they agree with what has come up um, as, as the plans for, for, for the new renovations and new construction. Um, we use patient and family advisors as partners on research projects as sub-investigators. Um, board level committees, you know, human resources and, and with our new hires and our new employee orientation, um, interviewing. And then even with our administrative committees, um, looking like one of the examples is our billing system. You know, billing is an issue in every organization. And so we engaged our, our patient and family advisors to help us to create a billing system that our patients and families could understand and even look at ways to, to pay their bill outside of the normal channels of, of, of going into our, our billing office or putting it in the mail. And, and their ideas of putting it, you know, open it up to the web and, and, you know, putting it in a manner that the patients and families understand, that it's a, just a click, 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 and, and they've got their bill paid and they understand it, it the way it looks and the way it feels. And then just kind of involving them in all operations, you know, when, when, when we're planning for things, having them at the table, you know, having them there and having them take part in the planning process, there's the strategic pieces of it, um, going through an affinity process that, uh, that we use to, to help to determine what programs, what goals, you know, or, or tactics we're going to use to move the organization forward. Um, and just some examples of partnership would be – I'm sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button here – would be using them to help us improve uh, patient and family-centered care rounds. Um, one of the projects that we had, we, we got a grant from the Picker Institute, and we were able to – to invite patient and families uh, to be sub-investigators to monitor and to audit the way rounds were taking place in our organization. And, and these rounds were, you know, having the team and, and being in an academic medical center, having the teams to, to, to sit down at the bedside and to set rounds um, at a certain time of the day. And what we would do is, you know, when, after rounds would take place, the, the patient and family advisors as the sub-investigators, they would actually give feedback to the physician on how they communicated, you know, how they made eye contact, how they involved the patient and family member um, in the rounds, and how they answered the question. If it seemed like they were, being, they were rushing through um, the process. And, and this was very important because our, uh, our patients and families that, that were there you know, thought that this was, this was a really neat thing to do to schedule rounding when families could be there. And if families couldn't be there, to have uh, the phone number where they could be reached and they could listen in to the rounds as the physicians went through. And, and what I have here on the screen is just, uh, just a picture of a rounding book that we put together um, on the patient and family center care rounds uh, research you know, in the, in the steps that we, we took to, uh, to improve the rounds. 
and just some of the things that were said, you know, about the rounds, the benefits was rounds this way are wonderful. They help to ease the patient's mind. It makes it so much easier. Being able to to talk to the, the, the providers, you know, to get information, having them to sit down next to the bedside and, and really engage in a conversation with the patient and family member uh, was important to our patient families. And then just one other quote, you know, was having patient family center rounds is like taking a wall between the doctors and the patient's uh, families away. You know, they didn't have that barrier. They didn't feel the barrier there. And this was important uh, to our patients and families, and, and these are some of the things that came out of uh, the rounds with the, with the sub-investigators. Um, just another thing here, some of the nurses, you know, uh, rounds with nurses help with the continuity of care, keeps people informed, keeps nurses informed, makes sure that we're all on the same page as, as patients, uh, as far as patient care is concerned encourages collaboration between the team and nurses. Patient and family center care rounds requires more time and coordination. No, it didn't. It, it actually took less time because the families got all the information that they needed to move forward. And then another project that we did was collaborating with our shock trauma unit. Um, we, we connected our shock trauma patient and family advisors with medical illustrators. As you know, when you're in a trauma unit, you have multiple injuries, and, and it's hard to describe to families what's going on and, and what is all the equipment that they have attached to them, the tubes and, and those kinds of things. And so we connected a group of our patient and family advisors with our medical illustration team um, that we have in, in our, our organization and they were able to do some animations. And these are computerized anim animations. And I just kind of wanted to show you, you know, what some of these things look like. And actually what you see here on the animations, they've made it to where it's a working part so that families can see exactly how the machines work. And, and when they talk about, you know, a nasogastric tube, the family knows what that is and where it is and what part of the body it's going into. And it's done in, the, in a way that patients and families understand. It's in a language that they understand and that they are a part of that. Another project was our Breast Health Center. And when we redesigned it, um, we, we had a group of uh, uh, young ladies who, who came in and, and who talked about, you know, their privacy uh, with, with going into our Breast Health Center when they were getting their mammograms. They would go into one room and they would change into their gowns and they would have to come back and sit in an area that was, was like a waiting room at the front of the, 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 the clinic or the practice site. And everybody that walked by when the doors were open could see who was sitting there and, and the women were sitting there in these gowns. And so one of the things that came out of this was they wanted to change the way it looked. They wanted to change the perception of, of going to get a mammogram are going into breast health for a biopsy. And they set it up to where the, the women would come in and it was a spa-like atmosphere. And, and they checked in in one area and then they went back into another area and, and to where they changed. And they were able to sit there and as though they were waiting to get a, a, a facial or a manicure or pedicure. And it, this relaxed them before they would go back to have their mammogram done or before they would go back to have their uh, uh, biopsies done. And, and once they had these things done, once they, they went through, there was areas in there if they wanted their spouse to be there with them, there was room for their spouse. And it still gave the women privacy to be able to, to do this. And if they had to get a biopsy, the area where they had the biopsy would be was, was set up as though they were in a spa and they were sitting next to a waterfall and, and waiting um, to, for recuperation. And these things were important. Every step of the way, you know, the, 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 the patient and family advisors that were a part of this, you know, they really put thought into it and they helped the, the organization to see how important it was to them and where we were lacking in our, in our other designs. 
So when we were working on hand washing, our hand washing initiative, you know, we're, the, the way to improve it, um, we had patient and families as a part of that. They, they helped us build the campaign. They helped us do auditing of the faculty and staff. You know, they confronted the faculty and staff. If, if they walked with you or they were walking and observing, if you didn't wash your hands going into the room and they didn't see you wash your hand as you were coming out of the room or even put on the phone, they would stop you and they would tell you. They would let you know that, you know, it's important for you to wash your hands. They, it was a constant reminder. And we had patients and families throughout our organizations just, just following people and getting them used to people monitoring them washing their hands. Um, but they also, they didn't just, you know, uh, reprimand them when they didn't wash their hands uh, going in or out. They also rewarded them. They gave them a, a button to say, I washed. And, and people understood what that means. And, and, and I'll tell you, our physicians enjoyed listening to that because they wanted to make sure that everybody knows that, that they washed their hands. So some of our results um, for, for us implementing patient and family centered care and working with patient and family advisors was, you know, our Neuroscience Center of Excellence. When it was the first unit that we started with, when we, when we opened the unit, it was open with, with uh, education. It was open with all staff looking, uh, having to reapply for their jobs. They were interviewed by patient and family advisors, not just the, the uh, staff, but also the physicians. And everybody that could uh, practice on that unit had to go through the patient and family advisors. And I'll tell you, once we implemented that, it was amazing. You know, the unit was the worst unit in the hospital, and it went from the 10th to the 95th percentile in patient satisfaction. Right now it still continues to hover around the 75th to the 90th percentile. Staff vacancy rate was at 7.5. Now they have a zero vacancy, and they have many people that continue to want to go work on that unit. We have implemented patient and family centered care throughout our organization. But that unit has built a culture being the first one that everyone is trying to mimic. And you've got employees that want to work on that unit because of, of the teamwork that they have and, and the ability to work alongside the patients and families that help them to get started. Um, discharges increased by 15.5%. And then we had a 62% decrease in medication errors. And these things were truly um, – remarkable for our organization. And I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with you. I apologize for, for I get so excited that I, I, I forget to advance my slides sometime, but hey, it all works out. And so, oh, Bernard, you're wonderful and what an inspiration to everybody on the call. Very, very exciting work and I'm sure you have inspired folks to either move their, advance their partnerships with patients and families or just get started on this journey. I, I know they'll feel like you do that it is the the best part of your practice, the best thing you've ever done in, in healthcare. We've got some great questions, and um, one of them talks about an IOM report about health literacy um, that was published around 2005 and looked at um, – um, the issues and what we're doing in terms of supporting health literacy. Any thoughts, um, Bernard, from your perspective of, of other organizations that are doing this or, or what specifically you've done, but you've involved patients and families to help you? Uh, any other thoughts around health literacy? Well, we actually have a physician in our organization that's, that's worked really close with us um, to to look at health literacy and and what she has done is she has pulled a, together a group of uh, of our patient and family advisors to look at the materials that that we we put out and how we work with um, patients you know not just patients who, who with with education um, but also our limited English proficient patients and how do we how do we bring to them and involve them in, in our organization to help make changes. 
And so she has been one of our biggest advocates. And, and one of the things she's, she's done that I really like is that she's brought them in as, as a separate sort of advisory council, and, and they're sort of an ad hoc. They don't meet every month. They meet when there's materials that, that they want to have reviewed um, and to make sure that they understand it, that it's in a language that they understand, and not just the language that they understand, but also, you know, if they understand the diagnosis completely and what are some of the other ways that we can, can explain the diagnosis in a way that they will be um, able to follow it, you know, to com be compliant with, with the instructions that the physicians give. And so it, it, it's all about looking at, at your population and, and bringing them in to help you to, to make it better. Um, that's, Bernard, I think that's a, a great answer that you really it, – it models that whenever you have an issue come up that affects patients and families, you involve them in that work. And so you've – particularly in the health literacy, you want people who are new readers or who, who aren't able to read – to be part of that, and and it sounds like your physician is respectful of their abilities and providing the appropriate support so they can contribute meaningfully. Yeah. Uh, knowing you, I know that your office s supplies extra support to make sure that they're successful. I we know do. on on a national level, um, the uh, Health Research and Education Trust will be publishing a survey later this. Uh, summer that's going to look at um, a random sample of hospitals and their patient and family engagement practices. And part of it is around how are hospitals in the U.S. communicating with patients and families. It's going to look at how they're involved as advisors, how we share useful information so they can participate and share decision making. And so I would look for that report sometime in June and July, I hope, coming out from HRET. Um, that uh, particular survey has been funded by the Moore Foundation. Bernard, you also got a question about where did you get the grant from. And I, I think that might have been referring to your the Rounds grant. Did you talk it, about it? Was, it was the Rounds grant, and it was yes. a grant that was applied for. Um, we have a champion by the name of Pat Sadamka who, who truly, truly moved patient and family centered care in our organization and she applied for a picker grant and it was, it was one of the best grants I think we've ever had. It wasn't a whole lot of money and I tell you working with the patient and family advisors, we didn't need a whole lot of money because all the ideas and the research and things that, that we got out of it was truly generated by them and the, the, the feedback that they were giving to the physicians, but also the feedback that they were getting from the patients and families because they also went into the rooms afterwards to talk to the patient and family to say, what is it that you feel that we could have done better or the, the, how the rounds could have gone better? That's, that's great. Well, the Picker Institute um, closed its doors a year ago, and we actually, they gave us the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care, their archived website. So you can go to our website and see all the past funding initiatives and products developed by the Picker Institute. Their, their last set of grants related to something called Always Events, and IHI is continuing that aspect of the um, Picker Institute. And so you might want to look on IHI's website about always events. Um, the third part of the legacy of the Picker Institute um, related to long-term care, and that work is being continued by Plane Tree. So all those are sources that you might want to look for if you want it, you're interested in that. And I, I'm assuming uh, with the person asking about where the grant came from when you were doing that work and, and um with rounds, the Macy Foundation will be coming out in June with a wonderful report about very much in keeping with the topic of today's webinar, and it's on engaging patients, families, and communities in uh, the education of healthcare professionals across disciplines, so interprofessional education and linking it to um, 
the redesign of uh, clinical practice. So I would urge you to follow the Macy Foundation. We will be reporting about it on our website, but I think that's exciting information coming out. Um, we actually have more wonderful questions. You all are such a great group. Um, th this is a, a real pet peeve of mine, and Bernard, well, you take a crack at this and see what your thoughts are. Um, this person uh, from University Group is talking about that patients say that the patient rights and responsibilities notice. It's often hanging on a wall and black type and a black frame um, are little more than a wall plaque. Any thoughts about how that strikes you, uh, Bernard? Well, one of the things that we have uh, we have done is we're we're now printing uh, the patient rights and responsibility. I've actually just updated our rights patients' rights and responsibility to include uh, the LGBT uh, community as well, um, mm -hmm. because that is an important aspect to uh, health care. Sure. Um, and we also have it in what we call our concierge book that we have in each of our patients' rooms, um, not just our inpatient, but also in our, our outpatient setting. Um, and we're trying to, to really push a little more of when we do our orientation to the unit that the patient's rights and responsibilities are covered. Um, right now, my group, uh, my patient family center care team, we make rounds on a daily basis, and we're, we're piloting, you know, the, the orientation of going through the patient rights and responsibilities. So, yeah, that, that's one of the things that if we're going to have it, we need to tell people about it. It should not just hang on a wall. It's, it's like patient and family center care. Yes, I have a plaque on the wall to talk about what we do, but we've also got to tell people, you know, what it is and why it works. Reading is different than 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 actually doing. And I I think so often they've not been developed with patients and families, so they're written in a style that's not as comfortable. And um, I think the more we can help people translate the overarching concepts to their experience and what's relevant from, from them and to really have them part of it and how it should be displayed. Uh, sometimes I think it almost feels scary and it puts almost a burden. There's an interesting question or really comment in, amongst the group. Where, uh, I'll just read it to you. Sometimes patients lack resources to cause compliance and honor of provider mission. Hence, patients go into despair. Also keep in mind often families are exhausted as this takes place with, within medical burdens. You know, I think we don't want to imply, and Bernard, you may have some thoughts on this as well, that uh, this is placing a burden on patients and families. This is respecting and involving them in the ways they want. And so it it can work for anyone because it's it's that respect of individuality and and preference that grounds the way clinicians and staff work. Any thoughts you have on that, Bernard? Well, I'm going to just give you an example from from my own personal life. Um, Great. Uh, some of you know that uh, my parents, my, I had both my parents in the hospital at the same time, and it is overburden. It is a it was a big burden, and I will tell you. The, the choices that we were, we had, the rights that we had was very important um, because I attribute the, my uh, involvement in my being engaged in my dad's recovery from his stroke and even my mom from her, her colon cancer, I attribute their getting better to my involvement and my sister's involvement and how the staff really helped us to understand, you know, uh, what was going on and what needed to take place. You know, when physical therapy came in with my dad and said, you know, this is what you need to do on a daily basis. And, yes, we're only going to be in here for, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes a day, but what you do outside of this is going to be very helpful to him. And I took that to heart. Um, it was my choice to do that. They didn't tell me you have to do this. It was the choice and the rights that we had to be able to do the things that we were, we were able to do. 
And I just kind of look at, you know, patient and family-centered care and involving and engaging patients and families. I look at that as, as one of those rights. And, and I may not be able to do it all the time. I may be too exhausted to do it, but it's my right to be able to be there when I can be there. And, and we don't force that on anybody because we know that families, you know, the patient's families, they have other obligations as well. And so I just think we need to be able to let uh, families know that, you know, we want you there. And, and it is a right for you to be there. But if you can't, that's why we're here. We're here to help take care of your loved one. You've really captured that, respecting their choice. And when you don't do it that way, you really place an emotional burden. It makes it even harder because you're denied doing what you your choice is or what you would like to do. Thank you for sharing that. That's really wonderful. There's another thoughtful question that um, I think many people may – uh, share in wondering about this. How does one cause enforcement and compliance with such statements? So I'm thinking about the core concepts of patient and family-centered care, of respect and dignity, information sharing, participation and collaboration. You know, who, how do you enforce that? You might, you know, talk a little bit about uh, human resources and other ways. Um, Bernard, or you may have other thoughts on that. Well, I'll tell you, it, it starts when, when, when potential employees go to our website. When they go to the website and to apply for a position here, one of the first things they're going to see is the statements on patient and family-centered care, and they're going to see those four principles, and this is what we expect. And then once, once they apply and they, they happen to talk to one of our talent acquisition folks, they're going to remind them of those four principles. And when they come in for an interview, they're, they're going to be reminded of that because a lot of them will be interviewed by patient and family advisors. And then even after that, you know, when they come to orientation, if they're hired, when they come to orientation, they're going to get an orientation on patient and family-centered care, on the four principles of patient and family-centered care, on the voice of the patient and, and how that works in our organization and why it is so important for them and then it, it goes even further, Bev. It, it actually goes to the point to where we also um, we do annual training. Uh, it's a part of our an mandatory annual training in our organization. And then your annual evaluation, it has patient and family-centered care as a part of that. Your job description has patient and family-centered care and the expectations of, of, of your, your position with patient and family-centered care. So to work in our organization, uh, and, and if you're going to apply, just know that you're going to have to follow the four principles. And one of the things that I like is that the employee has to prove how they're working with patient and family center care. It's not left up to the manager. The manager can, can look at what they're doing, and they can talk about what, what they've observed, but the, but the employee has to be able to explain what did they do, you know, following those four principles. How did you show respect and dignity to our patients and families? You know, how did you share information? You know, what did you do to, to get patients and families to participate in care, in care? And how did you collaborate with patients and families, whether it be, you know, asking them their opinions uh, as an inpatient or bringing in our partners, the, the patient and family advisors, to help you with a project? So That's they great, have Bernard. I think, we're, I think that gives them lots to work on, that they can embed it in human resources and the vision and mission and values of the organization. I'm afraid we're just about out of time, and I want to turn it back to Judy at ARC uh, to bring our discussion to close and thank everybody for participating today. And thank you, Bev and Bernard, for a wonderful and informative presentation and so much information for our audience to digest. Um, if you would like more information on patient and family-centered care to our audience, ARC has a number of resources available. I know you've uh, gotten a lot of information today, so we invite you to take a look at the ARC guide to patient and family engagement in hospital quality and safety and other resources that are on the ARC Patient-Centered Medical Home webpage. And these resources are also available by clicking on the Resources button at the bottom of your screen. 
And we invite you again to join us on July 22nd for our next learning and networking event on patient and family-centered care for children and older adults. You can visit our website to register. And remember to follow us on Twitter. Um, once this event ends, and I really hope you all will stay on because there's an evaluation that's going to appear on our screen. And we would really love for you to participate in this. Um, as ARC plans its future resources, it's very helpful for us to learn how you, what you get from these uh, web events, how you might be using this information, for instance, that you just heard today. So it also helps us to improve our offerings for future events. So please do take the time to fill that in. And again, you can contact us at any time at info at innovations. Arc .gov. And thank you again so much for joining us today.